So this is a podcast interview with one million lottery winner Ann Canavan. Are you listening? So this is a podcast interview with lottery winner Ann Canavan. She won one million pounds tax free from the Euro Millions in 2016 in Northern Ireland. My name is Timothy Schultz. If you are new to this channel, you might not know that I also won the lottery way back in the day. In 1999, I won the Powerball. Before going back to college to study journalism and broadcast news, I'm now combining my experience with these things with my desire to meet others that I find fascinating. Some of these people are other lottery winners, and Ann Canavan is one of those people. I was super, super excited to sit down with her and hear what it was like to win this one million as well as how it changed her life. You know, she had an urge at 1 a.m. the night that she won, in the middle of the night, she had an urge to check her ticket. And so we got to talk about that. It was very, very interesting. We even got to discuss her experience inside of a haunted house and the time that she saw a UFO. <laughs> it's very, very interesting stuff. But the lottery really, really changed her life in a very big way when she won Euro Millions. One million tax-free in Northern Ireland is a very, very fascinating conversation. So without further ado, let's get to it. Here is my podcast interview with 1 million Euro Millions lottery winner, Anne Canavan. So I'm here with Anne Canavan, who won 1 million from the Euro Millions. Anne, how are you today? Hi, Timothy. I'm great. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much for taking the time. Now, you are in Ireland. Is that right? I am, yes. I was born in London, in Wimbledon, near the tennis, but I, I now live in Ireland. Yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations on your, your lottery win. There's so many things we want to talk about here today, but, but first of all, what did you win and you know, how did that happen? So I won on Friday, the 28th of August, 2015, one million pounds sterling. It was actually the Euro Millions draw, which is for the whole of Europe. And um, and I didn't win the main draw. I won a million because each week they have, or it's twice a week actually, they have a, a raffle ticket, which is uh, on the bottom. It's just this little number here. Hmm. And so that's what I won with. So it's just a big, like this particular one is XZXZ XZ and then some numbers. So that, they don't do it anymore. But back then, I think once a month, they had like a Super Friday or something where they had, they made 10 millionaires. If your number combination was correct, then you won a million. But I didn't only win a million. I also won a fabulous trip to um, Song Sa Island in Cambodia. Uh, which was all expenses paid, and we stayed in the Royal Villa, and we flew out um, business class, which was fabulous. So I took three of my children. Unfortunately, Lauren was away in America at the time, and and my grandchild. Wow. So that was fabulous. And so each week, like now, say I think today's Tuesday. Yeah. So tonight there'll be a Euro Millions draw, and there'll be one millionaire maker. Um, there'll be one person and they've done away with the 10, the super Fridays. So I was actually number four on that list. So had it just been a normal Friday, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have won. Yeah. That's amazing. Did you pick your own numbers or were they computer generated? Yeah. I just always do a lucky dip. Okay. We call it a lucky dip here. Hmm. So computer generated. Yeah. And I was reading anyway that it's, it's tax free. It is, Timothy. It's 100% tax-free. Yeah. Wow. And you can either choose to go public or remain anonymous. And I did decide to go public because uh, I knew, I mean, a, a million is a fabulous amount to win, but it wasn't like sometimes Euro millions can be really high, you know, like your American ones. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think I would have been hounded by the press and stuff, you know, if it's a big super winner. Mm -hmm. So they, I wasn't going to go public, but they did keep asking me, Camelot, who are fabulous, they run the lottery. Mm -hmm. And they, they kept asking me, do you want to go public? And I said, no, 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 no. And then after about a month, they nicely broke me down. They didn't pressure me. <laughs> <laughs> because they said how they, they, they put it to me was like, uh, well, they said, just have a word with the PR guy. They have a PR guy. And he said to me, well, this way you can control what you want to have said about you rather than just them press making, well, you know, saying what they can find out. Mm -hmm. So I took the opportunity then to showcase my inventions and to say, this is what I want to go ahead and do now. So 
Hmm. I think that's why they like the story as well, you know, because uh, of the inventions. But I'm glad I went public because having gone public, they have attended some fabulous events with Camelot, you know, like glamorous shoots. Mm -hmm. I have a picture here. This is one when we were in Arnho House. Oh, wow. So yeah. and it's, the whole thing is just fabulous. You know, like they put you up and just make it a nice glamorous event. And, and of course, you then meet other lottery winners, which is nice too, because they're just ordinary people like me, you mm. know, and um, and it's just it's lovely seeing different people and what they've won and how it's changed their life. So so I, I'm glad I went public because I didn't get hounded by anybody. And, mm. and I've had some great – I've attended some great events with Camelot. That's uh, different than the United States anyway. You know, there's no place to really meet other lottery winners like that. And so that's that's really special. I think. It is, yeah. You know, I want to get into your inventions a little later, but you mentioned it with Camelot with these appearances. You know, what did you showcase for for your invention? I didn't actually showcase them, but oh. when I went public with the first in the newspapers, you know, lottery winner, I could have that as and kind of an inventor, you know. So I didn't showcase any, but it just gave me an opportunity to, I don't know, just be more public and just have more of a public platform if I if I so wished mm -hmm. to to push them. But when we go to the events, it's it's just glamour, glamour, glamour. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So after you received that attention, did you did people recognize you out in public? Were you sort of like a quasi celebrity or did it affect <laughs> I wouldn't say it's any shape or form, but um, people did, yes. Locally, yes, they definitely did, yeah. Well, actually, you know, last, I think a month ago, two or three weeks ago, I just had this feeling that I was going to win again. Hmm. And and so I didn't want to buy a ticket in the town. So, well, I live in Ireland, so I, it, I bought my ticket in Derry in Northern Ireland because I live very close to the border. Hmm. Um, but I didn't, I don't like to kind of, go and buy tickets because sometimes people think, oh, you've won it once, don't be greedy. <laughs> and so I drove um, eight minutes outside the town to go and buy this ticket because yeah. I just had this feeling. And so I got my son to meet you. I said, do you fancy driving up the road a bit? And he said, what for? And I said, I'll tell you later. So as soon as I walked into the shop, because I didn't think they'd know me there, and I walked in and, I, and it was at 7 o'clock and you can only buy tickets to 7.30. And mm. so I walked in and I said, oh, can I buy, um, I think it was the Europe lottery. I think it was the Irish lottery. I mm. said, can I have a, a lucky dip lottery ticket? And he said, aren't you the one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And I said, yes, I was trying to go outside the town to be incognito. Because <laughs> I always feel kind of guilty buying another ticket. <laughs> oh. And guess what, um, Timothy? It wasn't huge, but I knew. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, again, it was a it was a little lottery ticket that you have this number, and I won five hundred euros. Wow! Congratulations! I just, knew, I just knew. Isn't that funny? That's well, I mean, I had a strong in inclination. That's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. With your win of a million, you know, I was reading anyway that you also had you know something really. I don't want to call it strange, but. At 1 a.m., I read that you woke up or that you were awake and you had a hunch that you had one or what happened? Okay, so it was a Friday, Friday the 28th of August. And that evening, earlier on, I was out washing my car and my neighbor was there and I was chatting to him and I said, oh, it's the Euro Millions tonight. And he said, oh, yeah, that's right. And there had been a couple three or four years prior to that. They'd won something like three million. And he said, yeah, remember that couple in such and such a place and they won three million? I said, you know what, Tony? I said, I think it's just about time that the Euro Millions, that we brought the Euro Millions back here, not really, you know, knowing that. And then when I was, I was, just happened later on, I think the, the, used to, the draw used to be at nine o'clock then. And I was running up the stairs and I looked at the clock and I thought, oh, it's the Euro Millions draw now. And I never, ever had thought that before. And then later on, and I never check my ticket. I've never, ever, ever checked my ticket on the day. I kind of throw it in my bag, and then I might have three or four. And it could be a month later that I check my ticket. And But that night, I was just about to go to bed. And I, I don't know if I had switched off the laptop and switched it back on again or was about to switch it off. And I thought, you know, I'll just check my numbers. And I've never done that before in my life. I didn't check them because I thought, oh, I'm going to win. I just thought, oh, I'll check them. And I thought, well, well, I won't. I did. 
And there we go. And I couldn't believe it. I, I had to keep rereading the numbers and checking and checking and checking. And so then I ran upstairs and I got, went into my daughter, Lauren, who was starting work the next morning for her dad just in the summer. And I said, Lauren, guess what? Guess what? I said, I've just won a million. She didn't believe me because she's a bit of a prankster. So she thinks everybody's a prankster. <laughs> it took me about 15 minutes to convince her to come down because I couldn't unplug the laptop because the battery had died. And if I unplugged it, it would just switch mm. off. So I, ma I managed to persuade her to come down and, and she saw it. And we sat up till five o'clock that morning just thinking – Mm. who we're going to give what to and we'll help somebody do this and we'll help somebody do that. Drinking tea, I might add, mm -hmm. um, until five o'clock. Yeah, so it's pretty unbelievable. And it, you know, it took months for it to sink in, really. I knew I'd won it, but to really feel it, it took months. Then the next day I had to convince my other daughter. We, we, we looked for her around the town. She was around the town. We were looking for her. And we found her, and it, again, it took us about 15 or 20 minutes. She wouldn't believe it. And Lauren said, she said, no, it's true. It's really true. And she said, no, it's not the unprecedented. So it took a while, you know, for people to believe. Huh. Wow. So there were people that did not believe you? Yeah. And then there was another person I spoke to and uh, my ex-partner. And when I told him, he said, so people really do win it. And I said, of course they do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think people think it's like not true. I don't know. Yeah. Did you think that you would ever win before it happened? I did, you know. I just kind of did. Yeah. Hmm. And funnily enough, about six weeks before that, I was at work and a girl I was working, a lady I was working with, she said, oh, you know, there was a huge big win in the Euro Millions. And I, of course, I hadn't checked my tickets, bought them, threw them in the bag. And I was convinced. I thought, oh, and she said, it's local. It's somebody local. And I thought, oh, my God, that's me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, what if I don't see you tomorrow? She said, I said, what if you don't see me tomorrow? I've won. And but anyway, <laughs> I came home. And I checked it because it wasn't me. But I don't know. I do believe in, you know, attracting stuff and if you and, and energy and what you vibrate on. And um, maybe it was because I was so convinced that I had, you know, Mm. kind of uh, been on that energy that uh, I think about six weeks later I did win the million yeah wow so it was six weeks from about the... six weeks after that yeah mm. wow that's amazing and it's it's so interesting that there are people that this I mean you're not alone there are a lot of people that experience this type of thing I mean it is rare mm. because not many people won the lottery but of, among the people that I've interviewed, it's interesting how many people have experiences like this. So that's incredible. And every time I checked the numbers, I would always say, and if it, if it wasn't me, and when I didn't win that time, I kind of thought, well, I hope I wish them the best, the people that had won it, <laughs> that, that had won the money I thought I'd won. And I thought, well, I wish them all the best because my turn's coming. And every week, or not every week, every time I checked my tickets, and it wouldn't, I wouldn't have won. I'd say, okay, never mind next time. You know, so. you know, when you, when you purchased the ticket that day, were you playing with the intention of I'm going to win today? Or was it just like, I know I'm going to win someday and I'm just going to. No, it was someday, someday. And actually there's a funny story, Timothy, about that. Because mm -hmm. when I bought the ticket in Derry, Northern Ireland, which is about half an hour away from where I live in the, in the South of Ireland, I went to the ticket place and I bought one, I think that was for a Tuesday night. And then I had two pound coins. It wasn't my last two pound coins. That would have been a great story, wouldn't it? <laughs> my last two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I had two because it's a different currency where euros in Ireland and sterling mm. in, in the UK. Hmm. So I had these two pound coins in my right hand. And I said, okay, do you know what? I'll just do one for Friday. I'll just do a lucky dip for Friday. And, and it was kind of, a, you know, just a, an afterthought. Little did I know. Wow. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this was, as it would be for most people, this was a, a life-changing win for, for you. Is that right? Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think because I'm older, I didn't fritter it away. You know, I think somebody, not all younger people, but I think when you're younger, you know, kind of want to spend it more. But I, I invested some, I bought some property, I went on holidays, you know, I kind of, um, I just didn't fritter it away. I didn't buy a big, expensive car. I bought a new car, but it wasn't brand new, you know. So I bought things that would 
not depreciate in value that would hopefully appreciate in value. Hmm. And and you have done some traveling? I have. Mm-hmm. Well, we went to Cambodia, Songsar Island. Mm-hmm. It's a private island and it was fabulous. Mm-hmm. And I went to Jamaica, Cuba, USA. Um, I went there to visit one of your uh, people. He's a guy called Jonah White. He's the inventor of the Billy Bob Tea. And I went over to visit him to get some advice on my inventions. Um, hmm. Russia, Europe, and Caribbean cruise, and a few countries in Europe. Yeah. Wow. Some European countries. Huh. Yeah, incredible. And had you done, you hadn't done that sort of traveling before, or was it just easier? I, I think it's huh. easier. I could go at hmm. more of a whim. I, I am a traveler. I do like to travel. Uh-huh. Um When we grew up, we did a lot of traveling with my mum and dad. So I I had been to Europe a lot, but, you know, this has made it much easier and Mm -hmm. and I could just do it at a whim if I wanted. Yeah, that's incredible. So you were a house cleaner. Is that correct? Before Uh, you went? So I, by profession, I would be kind of secretarial and HR. But when we moved back to Ireland from England, and I did have an income from my property in the UK that was rented out, but I didn't want to because I was a single parent. I didn't want to just have that. And also I wanted to save up for my inventions. So I took a job that was um, compatible with my son's school hours. It was um, housekeeping in a hotel. So it was cleaning bedrooms, yeah. And I'd never done it before, but needs must. And I did that. Yeah, that's what I was doing at the time. So I Mm. didn't tell anybody, you know, for about a week that I had one. Mm -hmm. And I went to work the next day and I was in there making beds and I had that secret nurse to myself. So it was nice. You know, I I remember that day I was thinking, wow, (laughs) nobody knows. But I didn't want to let my colleagues down because it was, you know, the end of the season and it was exceptionally busy. And it was a bank holiday weekend. So it was exceptionally busy and I knew it just would have really been, you know, hard if they were a man down. So so I went yeah. in. Wow. How were you feeling when you were in there working this job that you knew that you, you know, just won a million and you're still in there working for another day? No, I did like over a week. I did my, oh, I wow. gave my week's notice because again, I didn't want to let my colleagues down. Mm-hmm. And I didn't tell anybody for a week because I had to wait for the agent to come over from mainland UK. And so I think I, well, I won on the Friday. It was the following Friday before she could get over. And we did like the exchange of the ticket and, and everything else. So I didn't want to let it be known, not that I don't trust anybody around here, but, you know, you, I, I had this little pink slip of paper that was worth a million bucks. <laughs> what did you do with it? Well, that's a funny story. We, we babysat it, Timothy. We babysat. It was in a bag hanging in my wardrobe. And sometimes if we left, if we all left the house, I would have it with me, you know, tucked away. I put it in a piece of plastic so it didn't get ruined. But I had taken a picture and I had phoned mm-hmm. them up. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I phoned them up and they ask you all these questions like, oh, there's a number at the bottom here. And what's that number? And where did you buy it? So it was verified. But I said, what if I lose it? And they said, well, just don't. <laughs> so oh, it had wow. been verified that I had won it. But actually, if I had lost it, mm-hmm. I would have had to wait six months. Hmm. Yeah, that would be... So we at it, basically. We, like, if I was out... And it wasn't the fact... I had um, a guy in working in the house, like a builder. And mm-hmm. I trusted him. I would trust him implicitly. But it's just the front door would be unlocked. He'd be in and out. And, and sometimes there's strangers around in the town, especially in the summer. And, you know, it's not that I didn't trust anybody here. It's just it's a million bucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would make me a little nervous, I think. <laughs> yes. I was very glad when we met the following Friday and I could hand it over. No, absolutely. And when you did hand it over, is that pretty instantaneous that, that they award the money to you or is there another process or so they take your bank details and Mm. then it's transferred within about three working days okay so pretty quick oh yeah pretty quick so people that aren't familiar with you you have done quite a few things i mean you're an inventor as you mentioned you're also an author i was reading you contributed to a book that was a bestseller 
through yeah, the, the Irish Amazon, Times and Irish yeah, through Times. Amazon. Yeah. And, be life or be leaf. Yes. Yeah. So, so what is that and where can people find it? Oh, Amazon. Hmm. Be life or be leaf. Um, it can be found on Amazon. Um, it's a Donna Kennedy and co authors. Yeah. That's where you find it on Amazon. And, and I've also written, this is one of my own little short story books that hmm. I've got printed. And I've written 15 short stories. They're kind of like, you don't know the Mr. Men. They, they were, the, here, there were these little Mr. Men books, and uh -huh. they, they became very standard here. So I've written 15 short stories. But I only got one. That's the one I showed you. I only got uh -huh. one um, illustrated, but uh -huh. the rest of them are all in here. And, yeah, I just I love writing. And I'm also writing, although I haven't done it lately, I must get back to it. I'm writing um, a kind of fantasy story, hmm. fantastic fantasy. So snot blot, what is snot blot? It's, uh, it's a little wrist-worn gadget that stores tissues, really. That's, that's it. But I've got, I think, something like 26 other ideas, which are various stages. Some are still just on the list. Some I have. 3D images, some I have a uh, prototype. I've got one prototype in the kitchen. So I just love it. I love innovation and invention, and that's my passion. Dancers dance. Yeah. Artists, and I love innovation and invention, and I love the stories like joy. joy. I want to be the Joy Manjano of Ireland. Well, I would love to be. Mm -hmm. I love Joy Manjano. I love her story, and that's one of my favorite films, Joy. That's wonderful. So you are you know, pursuing your your passions that you had prior to the to the lottery one, oh, yeah. but now yeah. you have more time to put your energy towards them. Is that correct? A hundred percent correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. You found me, Timothy, due to the um, Kevin Bell Repatriation Trust. Yes, yeah, yeah. I found you through an article through that someone else that had won the lottery that. Because they did, yeah, his parents, yeah, yeah, that you know, and and so yeah, that's I mean that's sort of interesting in itself. So what is that for people that aren't familiar? Kind of another odd thing that happened, you know, kind of serendipity, I suppose. That's one of my favorite words. Was the fact that I was at a lottery event, one of the Camelot events, and I met this lovely couple, and they told me and and the other people attending that. They won a million. I believe it was a year after they lost their son, Kevin. Mm. And and I believe, yeah, it was an accident in, in the US, mm. in New York. And they had to repatriate him back to Northern Ireland. And eventually they set up the Kevin Bell Repatriation Trust. And so I met them. And then when I was authoring the book, this book, Donna always chooses a charity that the pre pre sale proceeds go to the charities. So there were, I think, twelve or fourteen of us in the no more than that because I'm chapter thirteen. <laughs> so uh, chapters in the book, and it's it's each person has their own story. It's kind of what they've gone through and coming good. It's kind of a feel good book. It's not chicken soup and soul by any means, but. Hmm. in that kind of category so we could choose a charity and I, so i put mine in the hand i thought i'm going to choose the kevin bell repatriation trust and it was chosen mine was the chosen charity hmm. and so i was really delighted and i just thought that was another you know kind of thing that i knew them and then i nominated their charity because it's such a good charity and hmm. yeah it's just another link in the chain of serendipitous events regarding the win yeah, that's wonderful. And for people that are not familiar, basically that is helping bring the body back to home. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. So, so if somebody dies abroad, um, they will take the the body, the deceased person back home. And you know, it's more than just the money. It's um, it's just they help with all the red tape, and there's an awful lot of red tape and officialdom to get through. So they kind of just take over because it's enough time just to be grieving without having to be making official calls and everything so they're, they're wonderful in the, in that respect and they're a lovely couple too they're mm -hmm. a really lovely couple yeah wow yeah that's great and then it's such a wonderful cause have you mm -hmm. have you found that some of these other lottery winners that that you've met that 
it, you know, it's been very life changing for them that it's affected them in, in similar ways to how it's affected your life? Um, or do you talk I, about yeah. that or? Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, everybody I've met. Some people have won twice. One wow. man, he said he won half a million first and then he won a million. <laughs> and there was another um, couple that I met and they had won twice. So lightning does strike twice <laughs> in the same place. And pretty much, yeah, you know, the people that I meet at the events, yeah, it has changed. Even most of them are amounts like mine because I think the mega, mega winners probably are just in a different stratosphere. <laughs> but, yeah, all the people I've met have um, – it has changed changed them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's incredible. I mean, it's uh, absolutely life-changing for most people. Yeah. We have spoken before, and I know that you – we got to talking about – this is sort of a different topic, but ghosts. because. I'm really into that subject. I find it very fascinating, but you have had some experiences. I have, Timothy. I lived uh -huh. in a real life haunted house. <laughs> wow. And it's still there. I don't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think because I'm very open to things and I don't, I think if you close yourself off to things, you, you won't experience them. But if you're kind of open, at least you're more likely to, although I was never seeking any of this, but I did. I happened to marry my girl's dad and he lived in a, in a house and it was very well known that it was haunted. And, mm. and I definitely had experiences and as have my children there multiple times. What happened? Well, one example was my children have seen things. I must be, I think what's clear audience and various audience. Mm. I've only ever felt and um, yeah, one night I was sitting and I could just feel this cold and I knew something was there and I thought, I knew it was there and I knew it was there for about 15 minutes and I just kept staring ahead. I thought, oh, I'm not even going to look. And then I could feel it go. But my daughter, for example, one morning, it was just an ordinary morning. It was April. We were heading off to the hospital. So it was just, you know, it was quarter past nine and she was going to get grommets in her ears. So it was a hospital appointment just for an ear thing. Hmm. And I was doing her hair and she said, oh, who's that lady that just walked past and like walked in one door and walked out another? And I said, what lady? Mm. And she said there was a little old lady all dressed in black and she was very hunched over. And I knew who that was. That was my husband's grandmother from the description. Mm. And I hadn't seen it. And, and she was for my daughter. She didn't mm. even know. There were no pictures of this um, grandmother. So she saw her, but she sees a lot. Cressida sees a lot. Another daughter, we went. I went into the room one time. And she was just sitting there, frozen in fear, and she said there was a little boy over there in the toy box in the corner, and she was so scared she couldn't even move, and her face was all blotched with tears. So we knew who that was. That was a little boy who was actually my ex-husband's brother had sadly died down there, mm. and. Other things, yeah, they've seen orbs. We didn't even know what orbs were at the time, but uh -huh. another daughter, she said she woke up in the night and she saw these balls of light. So huh. she followed them and um, she went downstairs and they disappeared. So the girls would always be seeing orbs. There's quite a sinister one as well. I think there's one sinister one down there because one night I was in bed and I was just about to go to sleep and I felt this big punch in the pillow really hard. Oh. I mean, I sat up, bolt upright. <laughs> and then I can't say I saw anything, but I kind of got the impression a swoosh, hmm. swoosh went past my, and I was so scared. I just threw myself back down, pulled the duvet up over me. And, um, and I thought, oh my God, I'm never, ever, how am I? I was too scared to even get out of bed anyway, I fell asleep. But then another time I was in this room, the nursery, and, and my daughter was in a bed kind of adjacent. And she was only little, and she wasn't feeling very well that night. And I had my back to that bed, and in my ear I heard this, Mommy, Mommy. Wow. And I thought it had gone up. I turned around, and she was in the bed. And in that same room, my husband would have had the duvet pulled off him. Hmm. And in the same room, every night we were in the room below, almost every night, and there would be one big thump, like, as if somebody had just jumped in the same corner on the the, the floor of the, the room above us. So we just kind of got used to it. Another time, this is the last one, and <laughs> it's not the last one, but the last one, I'll tell you. Another yeah. time um, I walked out of the room and I walked back in. It wasn't quite poltergeist, uh -huh. but, you know, poltergeist, the tables are all piled up on the chairs, are all piled up on the table. Right. Well, I walked in 
and all these big heavy chairs had been pulled out. And then later that evening, my little dog at the time, he or she was just yapping and yaps, barking and barking and barking, and she was growling and looking at something. And I was just sitting like this going, okay, okay. But what do you do? You can't run out of the house. Who? You can't phone the police. You just kind of have to deal with it, you know. And, yeah. Um, yeah, there's lots of lots and lots of stories, yeah. Wow. And even people, that were, we used to do a bed and breakfast down there, and um, some people arrived and they said they'd stopped to ask the way to our house. And people said to them, oh, no, why are you going down there? It's haunted. And we never had one trick or treater ever. At Halloween, nobody came near us. <laughs> wow. It wasn't that scary. You know, kind of got used to it. It was creepy at the time, but I mean, we, it was creepy, you know, especially in the night, think, oh, okay, and you're in the, mm-hmm. your own, in the haunted house. But like, huh. no harm ever came to me. Yeah. Know, or, but it's creepy, definitely creepy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. I've had my share of experiences myself and it's just really interesting. And some of those are from people that weren't, aren't necessarily stuck here, you know, people that have passed on and, Mm -hmm. you know, grandparents and that sort of thing. Yeah. Really interesting. There was one, I'm going to keep this very short because I don't want to talk about myself uh, very much at all, but there was one experience I had with, with a dog as well that uh, I felt this energy behind me that, I felt very uncomfortable and I was the only person in the house. And so I turned on the television and the dog came over and started, you know, looked directly at where I felt this presence and started barking and and then it went away. But yeah. to me, that was some sort of validation that, you know, maybe there's something that's actually there as I'm um, not just crazy. Was- and you know, Timothy, you feel it. You just, you feel it. It's definitely, it's a very palpable energy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. but trying to convey that to somebody. Yeah. I think, well, I don't have to prove anything to anybody. You know, I know what happened to me and the girls, my children and my ex-husband. Yeah. yeah. So you had that energy. Yeah. You can feel it. Like I knew that energy when my dog was yapping and yapping and, but I'm actually going, <laughs> at <laughs> right. this, and I was just sitting there thinking, Oh my God, I'm not even going to look that way. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then you can feel it when it's gone, you know, it's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's very interesting. But you had an experience also that was really rare with seeing a UFO. Is that correct? It uh, is correct, Timothy. And mm-hmm. hear me out to the end mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> because it'll kind of full, go full circle. Um, well, I, I was never, ever, ever interested in UFOs. Never. Like ghosts, yes. I used to come to Ireland when I was a young child and hear all the ghost stories. So somebody could say, oh, you know, you, you just really wanted to believe and that's what you saw. UFOs, I had no interest whatsoever. But a friend of mine who I worked with, he was UFO crazy and I was kind of ghost, you know, interested. Mm-hmm. And so it was November, I can't remember exactly what year, about 1980, something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was the first night I ever went jogging. And myself and my friend Grace set off. I went up to her house. We jogged around. And we went back to her house. We had a quick break. And I said, right, ding, ding, round two, let's go. And and I remember Miss World was still going then. So we had to watch that for like 10 minutes while we were just having our break. Mm. And um, so we set off. We went out her front door and we started to go down her pathway. And the first thing I heard was, a, I mean, we were not even thinking of anything. It was this <laughs> whooshing <laughs> sound. So I looked up to where the sound was, and it was literally just above the rooftops of the houses across on the other side of the road. Wow. And and all I could see was the underneath part. It was really big and round, and there were these lights underneath kind of going on and off, and amber and red, and amber and red, and they kind of just were not flickering, but I don't know, going. <laughs> and I remember looking up. And it was a swishing noise that that drew my attention to it. And then the next thing I knew, I always thought we'd just fallen over. But myself and my friend, Grace, we were both lying on our back. And I looked at her and I said, did you see what I just saw? And she said, yes. And then it just took off at warp speed and it was silent. It just went like that. 
And I know I huh. only saw the underneath, but I got the impression that it was the atypical flying saucer, which I was, if I was going to make it up, I wouldn't make it so cliche. Oh, yeah, it was a flying saucer. But that's what I saw. Huh. And then, you know, I knew what I saw. And when I went home that night, my mum was a teacher and she was marking, doing homework marking. And I went into the dining room and I said, you never guess what, mum, I just saw a UFO. And she said, did you really? <laughs> <laughs> my dad was in the sitting room reading the paper. And I said, guess what, yeah. dad? I, think, I said, I just saw a UFO. And he said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this is bizarre. And, you know, I had the loveliest feeling. I thought, I never, ever, ever have to convince anybody what I saw. I And I felt I had this really lovely kind of knowingness about me. And I thought, I ne and I will talk about it, but I don't try to, you know, meet people and talk about it generally, but I have no qualms talking about it. But hmm. I went into work the next day and I said to my friend, Tony, the big UFO believer, and I said, Tony, Tony, guess what, guess what? You never guess what I saw last night. I saw a UFO and he went, <laughs> No, you didn't. Uh, and I thought, do you know what? If he doesn't believe me, that's okay. But I thought, he's the big believer. And But it didn't even rock me. I thought, I don't care. I know what I saw. So mm. then fast forward, and I never doubted myself. And I, it was like I had this, you know, really lovely feeling. So fast forward seven years, I happened to be at home, off work, and I was doing just something very banal. I was plucking my eyebrows in the mirror. Oh. And just to show you how banal it was, uh -huh. and and there was a radio station, LBC, London Broadcasting Company, which has different shows each hour. And I hadn't even paid any attention anyway. And I, the the hour before it could have been an open hour or something, but they were talking about UFOs. And even then, I really wasn't that bothered because I don't remember any of the rest of the show. Hmm. But then I re I remembered hearing, and I grew up in a place called New Malden. Hmm. And then the guy, the presenter, said, next we have Richard from New Malden. So that kind of, you know, mm. my ears up. So I thought, oh. And so along on came Richard, and Richard from New Malden said, okay, I'll do his accent. About seven years ago, I was out walking the dog. I was out in Beverly Park, heard this whooshing noise, looks up, <laughs> in this great big spaceship. And he said, and then it just took off. And I thought, wow, I never needed validation. But there you go. Seven years later, I just happened to be at home, heard him on the show. And my hmm. ex-husband did say that apparently people who have had some encounter, mm -hmm. whether it's the first, second, third or fourth kind mm -hmm. um, or, or sighting, that quite often, I don't know, he saw a documentary. So it's only hearsay he told me he saw this documentary mm -hmm. that quite often people have had an, an, a sighting or something or um, they will have some validation, whether it's mm. months or years later that they'll. So that was kind of my validation. Mm. Isn't that strange? And yeah, I think it, I'm, I'm very delighted. No harm came to me and uh, I'm very glad that I saw it. That's fascinating. And to your knowledge, you weren't you know abducted or abducted. lifted up or anything i didn't even know about abduction then i did there was no internet back then mm. way back then <laughs> uh -huh. there was nothing and like i say i wasn't even interested in ufos i knew nothing about apart from that there were ufos somewhere uh -huh. and funnily enough you know a few years later when i like no not a few years later just about maybe five or six years ago i started thinking about about that and hmm. and I was thinking it's very strange that and I'm not saying I was abducted I, I don't I'm not but it's funny how we just took it for granted that we were both lying on our backs with our, our legs kind of you know in a v-shape up hmm. and um no not up <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, like this <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and lying next to each other. And I thought, I just always thought, oh, we tripped over each other. When we were looking up, we tripped over each other. But, and I never questioned it, but now knowing more and, mm -hmm. and having subsequently heard about abductions, I'm not saying I was abducted, how did we both end up in that position? That's not a falling over position, mm. which made me wonder. If I was, I have no memory. <laughs> Hmm. But would it be great? I never came to any harm. That's really fascinating. It's it's hmm. interesting that you know since the pandemic has happened, you know, on on this planet. Well, I just read a recent article. The New York Times put out this article about how UFO sightings are way up now. Really? But they're 
the theory, at least the theory that I read, was that it's not because there are more; it's because people are looking up to the sky more. But you know, I, I, there are so many credible people out there that have had experiences that it's just so, really, really fascinating. So many, aren't there? Really mm-hmm. credible people. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's... and then it was a Canadian minister for defence, I think, that actually said in the Canadian whatever it is Parliament that he wanted fifteen minutes just to say that he knew for a fact that at that moment in time there were X amount of what they call small blues or small whites and tall greys. I don't know. Hmm. And he said, so I thought that was incredible that he stood up and said, "I know for a fact," mm-hmm. and yet. People still disbelieve. No, it's yeah, this belief that we're the only, we're the center of everything, oh. but we don't understand hardly anything that's, you know, I, to my knowledge, I haven't seen an alien or, <laughs> or nor a UFO, but, I, you know, how can we be the only thing in this universe? We don't even know what's all in our own solar system. <laughs> so, exactly. And the guy who I, my friend who I went and told the next morning, the, the, U, the UFO kind of uh, fanatic. <laughs> About two or three years ago, I said to him on the phone, I said, do you remember that time I saw a UFO? And he said, uh, I said, are you still into UFOs? And he said, no. He said, I've spoken to a, a physicist or physics person. And he said, it's impossible. It's impossible. And I thought, well, that's only because we don't have the possibility. How do we know? Like, our physics says we can't go beyond a certain type of that a place and beyond. But it doesn't mean that other um, life forces or uh, in, in other galaxies or dimensions doesn't mean they don't have it. It's a very limited way of thinking, isn't it? Oh, because we don't have the, mm-hmm. the capacity to do it doesn't mean that there isn't other life out there. I never really give it a great deal of thought. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe we can't be the only ones. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's really, really, really fascinating stuff. Is there anything else that you want to say today before? We've talked about so many things, the lottery, snot blot, inventions, writing, ghosts, UFOs. Is there anything else that you want to say today that that I don't know enough to ask? Just that I consider myself a very lucky person. I've always considered myself lucky. And and I'm very grateful for all of my experiences, you know, whether they're paranormal or supernova (laughs) (laughs) land. I do consider myself a very lucky person, yeah, and and happy too. I generally wake up very happy. Someone would have to really poke me and annoy me and annoy me and annoy me. Um, so whether that just attracts things, I don't know. Um, energy, I do believe in in energy and vibrating on certain levels. But I'm looking forward to um, my next journey of licensing my products and watch this space. <laughs> The yeah. Joy Manjano of Ireland. Hopefully, Joy will watch it. I'd love to get in touch with her. Oh my God, she would be my my hero, my heroine. I yeah. love her story. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, that can happen soon. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. You never know. Other things have happened, haven't they, Timothy? Yeah, yeah. No, anything anything is possible, Inclu- yeah. including yeah. yeah, including the lottery, obviously. But and thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, your story is absolutely fascinating. Congratulations on your win again, and um, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Timothy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's always lovely to talk to another winner. Because they we are kind of rare. Well, you don't come across them so much. Yeah. yeah. It's it's like a small small club. It it really it's, is, isn't it? And it's it's a lovely club to be in. I have to say, I'm very grateful and full of gratitude to be in it. Yeah, and meeting interesting people like you as well. You know, it's been a pleasure to meet you and yeah, and to you. Yeah, you also. It, it is it is really really cathartic. I think and and um, fulfilling to meet other people that have experienced this thing that can really be life changing. I know. It, so. it really is. It's it's an honor. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. And I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. And plus, you know, you don't like to say too much to people who haven't won and, you know, they're struggling. But it really is nice when you can, when I meet up with others and I can tell them, oh, we were picked up in a private car, taken to the airport, and then it was business class. And when we went to Songsa, I mean, we just looked after. So it was a wonderful, that was nearly, I was more excited about that than, than winning the million. 
And and you can kind of say to them, but I wouldn't even tell my friends the details. I'd say, yeah, we had a nice time. We went there, mm. you know, but I wouldn't be saying, oh, we were picked up and we were taken and it was business class. I'd just say, yeah, we won at the holiday and it was lovely. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it is. It's nice when you can just, like, really fully appreciate it. I try not to brag about anything. I mean, I don't live a lavish lifestyle anyway, but, no, you really. know, after that happened, I tried to not boast too much among other no. people but because just, you are conscious that people are struggling very mm, conscious you know yeah. and it kind of i felt guilty for ages mm-hmm. timothy i felt so guilty you know that was a big thing with me i felt guilt mm-hmm. and i felt guilty if i could afford something and somebody i did help people out though i did i definitely we can't help everybody especially with a million it's a fabulous amount to win but you know it's, it's not an infinite number <laughs> yeah I felt the same way initially for, for a while because yeah. I don't know. Did you have people that, that um, kept asking for, or that asked for money or that? No, no, that's good. No. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I mm-hmm. absolutely didn't. Um, no, I think because mine was a million, I'm very grateful. You know, had it been mega bucks, I think, yeah, more so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's also, it's very interesting that you have, felt like a lucky person throughout your life because I feel like that's a thread of, among many lottery winners as well. So I sort of felt that way. So do you think there's something to that mentally or do you think that's yeah. just a coincidence? Or I do. Because I mean, if, if people feel lucky, they feel lucky for a reason. It's not because terrible things are happening to them. So it must be, if you feel lucky, I think you probably attract stuff to you. I do believe in, I mean, even Einstein said it's all energy, isn't it? And it's mm-hmm. what we attract and we vibrate on certain levels. And I think I I just did it unconsciously um, mm-hmm. rather than, you know, people try very consciously to attract stuff, law of attraction. But I think I just, I think, well, when I was young, I would just always be daydreaming and mm-hmm. and I would be, a lot of people say like, I would still be childlike. I mean, I'm not a child, but I still have like um, the stories. I can just really get into the kids level. You know, I love interacting with the little kids. I mean, my kids when they were younger and Mm -hmm. telling them stories. And it's just a lovely, innocent place to be, isn't it? You know, the innocence of kids. And I don't know, maybe (laughs) it's just (laughs) reverberate on that level. But I do. I think I'm very lucky and very blessed. Yeah. Not may it last. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that's that's wonderful. Well, Anne, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Your story is fantastic. And I definitely wish you the best of luck and hope to have you back again sometime. Okay, thanks, Timothy. Yeah, thank you. So that was my interview with Anne Canavan. If you like this interview, go ahead and hit the like button. And let me know in the comments, what did you think of this interview? I love checking out your comments. And also, what would you do if you won one million from the lottery. If you want to see more interviews like this one, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when they come out. As always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support.